pääosa, niin tarkoittaa sitä, että täytyy tutustua hieman vedalaisen näkemykseen historiasta. In the Vedic scriptures, particularly the Puranas, that's a section of scriptures which deals with cosmic history. Vedic kirjoituksessa on osa nimeltä Puranat, jotka käsittelee kosmista historiaa. And the Puranic history claims to go back to back millions and millions of years to the very beginning of the world. Puranoiden historia menee itse asiassa miljoonia ja miljoonia vuosia aivan tämän maailmankaikkeiden alkuaikoiden. And there, in the Puranas, we are told that the world in the beginning was created as a pure place, and everyone did have this knowledge. Ja Puranat kertovat, että siellä aikojen alussa tämä maailma oli luotu puhtaaksi paikaksi, jossa kaikilla oli tämä tieto. But there is also independence. Mutta sitten on olemassa myös valinnanvapaus. And over time, over time, more and more individuals more and more independent. Going their own way. And uh, you surely heard of the doctrine of karma. So karma means that for action there is a reaction. So the reaction to this Independence is an increase of darkness, of ignorance, of illusion. But I should better say misused independence. Because it is, there is independence in one's relationship with God too, because we are eternally individuals. Suhteessa Jumala on olemassa myös itsenäisyys, koska olen ikuisesti itsenäisiä yksilöitä. It's a relationship of love, so there's initiative in love. Puhutaan rakkaussuhteesta, ja rakkaussuhteessa on aina aloitteet. But when independence becomes completely selfish, yes, then this breeds ignorance and illusion. Mutta kun tämä itsenäisyys tulee itsekeskeiseksi, niin silloin siitä seuraa sitten tätä harhaa ja tietämättä. So over millions and millions of years, this cosmic karma, universal karma, has been building up, building up, and now you can see the result of it. And I should say also periodically throughout all this time, as I said, avatars are coming. And humanity is actually brought back to the right path. But then again they deviate. And again brought back. So it's a, it's a constant back and forth. And why is it like that? And it is because we are we are individuals. And it is within our power to choose. And so many of us choose again and again to go our own way. Even in the face of something superior, we reject it and go our own way. And that is simply the human condition. This is not a problem of Krishna conscious philosophy. This is a problem everywhere. So many examples can be given from world history. That he was a very nice path opened up, but the people chose other ways. But fortunately, God never gives up on us. Krishna never gives up. And there are many, many who are delivered through the ages who go back to God. God is a Krishna. But 
the number of souls in the material world is, cannot be estimated. See, every microbe, every bacteria is a spirit soul. So this, this room is filled with uncountable numbers of souls that we do not see. And eventually, birth after birth, they will all evolve to the human form. And by their karma, many will go back down into lower forms again. Some will go higher. Many will go back down. And that's all the two choice. So, my spiritual master always insisted, God never interferes with your choice. He's given you freedom of will. And the reason for that is that love depends on freedom. If we are to love God, it must be a purely voluntary choice. If we want to ask the question, why God just didn't make us perfect? Then what you are proposing is that God should be dictated. But God should somehow force us to love Him. Because that's not love. If I put a gun to your head, click back the hammer and say, now say you love me. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> you won't mean it. <laughs> because it can't be forced. So it's rather 
rather different from what is found in the literatures of this Hare Krishna movement. And so he is wondering whether there is something which is just being picked out from the scriptures about the being of Krishna. Because in the Krishna conscious books, he is described as purely spiritual person, whereas in the other book he has read, it seems like he has a sensual side. And then the other question is that this Vedic knowledge, is it something that, um, is there some opportunities for development further? Or is it something that we have to like uh, move from the old scriptures, studying the old scriptures and not just, uh, and, and not developing anything? Like in Western science, there is always this development. Well, okay, first question. See, we represent the Vedanta tradition, Vaishnava Vedanta. And uh, the Vedanta philosophy of Krishna consciousness aims at, yes, a purely spiritual goal. Ja Krishna-tietoisuuden vedantinen esittely, niin se tähtää puhtaasti henkiseen päämäärään. And this is a bit different from the, you can say, the populist form of Hinduism that you will just see in ordinary society. Ja tämä on hyvin erilainen kuin tämä populistinen näkemys hindulaisuudesta, jota nähdään tässä yhteiskunnassa ympärillä. Mm -hmm. So, in the populist form of Hinduism, then Krishna is presented, is understood to be, as you have said, a very sensual historical personality. But uh, in the Vaishnava Vedanta, this sensual side of Krishna is understood philosophically. That everything has its origin in God. Including sensuality. You see, so Krishna's uh, dancing with many, many gopis, coward girls. Is display of God's own pleasure potency, his transcendental pleasure potency. In the Vedanta, the, those girls, if you will, they are personifications of spiritual energy, God's spiritual energy, Shakti. So this is all realized in pure spiritual consciousness. And so I, I, yes, I am certainly aware that uh, uh, in, you know, less refined, you can say, less less refined understanding of, of Krishna, that uh, he's taken to be an ordinary person, a man, who was born on a certain date, who had many girlfriends and, and many amorous affairs. But this, this form of Krishna, this understanding of Krishna is, is useless for uh, spiritual advancement. Että monesti Krishna esitellään sellaisena tavallisena aistillisena miehenä, joka syntyi joskus, jolla oli monia tyttöystäviä ja ystävät. Mutta kuitenkaan niin tällaisella näkemyksellä ei ole minkälaista arvoa kuin muuta henkisestä edistymisestä. And this, this uh, low class understanding of Krishna is not accepted in any of the Vaishnava Vedanta schools. We are only one. There are three other main schools, and they all reject this idea. 
Ja mitkä näistä neljästä vaihtaa vedän tai koulutumista ei ole hyväksytty tuollaisen näkemyksen? Edustamme niistä yhtä, mutta olemassa paljon muutakin pääasiassa koulutumista. Mm. So then the, the question. Hmm? So, Well, uh, in Vedic, the culture of Vedic philosophy, there is of course the original Vedic scriptures, but they are constantly being commented upon throughout generations of, of saintly teachers to the present day. And these comments, commentation processes, is to adjust the ancient teachings to the present day, present day conditions. But I think that process goes on in any doctrine, any school of philosophy. <laughs> if, if, if you say, if someone says, I'm a Marxist, that means his beliefs go back to Karl Marx. And he may adjust those beliefs to the present day, but he still falls back on the authority of Karl Marx or Friedrich Nietzsche or Plato. If a Marxist says, I reject the teachings of Karl Marx, then he's no longer a no Christian or a Jew or whatever, or many, many religious movements actually. And, uh, but my question is a very practical one, and I do hope that you don't feel offended with my question. And that is that you emphasize several times that you are, in your movement, you are purely interested in spiritual uh, things, and you are not interested in material things. My question is, when you go around trying to share your your uh, philosophy with other people, why do you dress like that? Because it may become a barrier between other people and yourselves. Krishna 
And when it is used in his service, then it is spiritual. Because the effect will be spiritual. We have the example of a piece of iron and fire. So the fire represents spirit, the iron represents matter. But if you place the iron in fire, then the iron becomes red hot and acts just like fire. So, so yes, clothes, clothes are material, no doubt. This is cloth, like anyone else's cloth. But in this case, the cloth is being used, is being worn in consciousness of Krishna. So therefore this has the effect of provoking or invoking. Yeah, it could be provoking or invoking, it doesn't, but really it doesn't matter. Either provoking the thought of Krishna in someone's mind or invoking it. When people see us dressed like that, what do they think? They think, oh, there's a Hare Krishna. That's the name of Krishna. And it's appeared in his mind. And that's all we're interested in. <laughs> so maybe he's thinking badly, but really that doesn't make any difference. Because God is above for bad and good. God is absolute. He's above bad and good. So someone may think Krishna is bad, but that doesn't matter. It's the same transcendental thing. And that's, what, that's all we're interested in. <laughs> that's what we call advertising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's spiritual advertising. <laughs> Why not? You want to make it, you want to make it, you want to make it. But then, what is the most important thing about the Christian is the most important thing. Because the most important thing about the Christian is the most important thing. And then the most important thing is the most important thing.
So this is a very big question, and due to time constraints, I can only give a short answer, which I don't think is you know, very satisfactory to this question. But I will say that the whole idea of um, machine consciousness, if, I, I don't claim to be an expert in this, but I have done some reading in it. But as far as I know, it goes back to this uh, British computer scientist, Alan Turing. And he was the first one to propose a method of, say, manifesting some consciousness in, in computer machinery. And, but what, uh, what the Turing test amounts to is simply a trick. It's if you are fooled into thinking that a machine is conscious, then he says it is conscious. That's the basis of Turing's idea. And then they write programs to imitate, you see, you do a dialogue over a computer monitor, with, it may be another person on the computer, or it may just be a program, You're not, you don't know. But if the responses you get from what you write convince you that that is a person, that is an intelligence, then as far as Turing is concerned, you might as well say yes. That is intelligence, even if it's a machine. But this doesn't, at least to my mind, doesn't satisfy me. It's a very valid explanation of consciousness. And you know, I find all these attempts at artificial intelligence, they're all being hatched by conscious human beings. <laughs> That's where it starts. And they want to try to imitate or program a machine by their own intelligence. You see, put their intelligence into a machine. That's what I see. And then they're just hoping someday the machine will become independently intelligent from me. But so far, we're, we're not any one step closer to that. But from what I've read about art, the artificial intelligence lately, they have become a bit more sober and a bit more realistic than, <laughs> than artificial intelligence. is something very far from their grasp at present. So that's all I can say right now. I wish I had more time. We could talk about this. Well, yeah, this question that I want earlier. I was trying to explain in general all the ideas of the science and the part of the art when it comes to this scientific part.